Welcome to Center Stage. My name is Mark Gordon. On this show, we're going to talk with Michael Pollack. He's a film producer, and his latest project is Fields of Gold. It follows the rags-to-riches story of A.E. Staley, a man with only a third-grade education who rose to prominence in the fields of agriculture and professional sports. So stay tuned. Center stage, center stage, center, center, center stage. Center stage. How did you get started as a film producer? So my background um, in the film business started in financing. Uh, so I was financing uh, plays, or Broadway plays, off-Broadway plays, and plays in the West End in London, um, and also films. So back in the time when I started getting involved, films were independent films were primarily being financed on Wall Street. Um, and it's very, very different now, obviously. Uh, but at that time, it was pretty easy to walk into a, a hedge fund and get a, a single film financed. I didn't do any slate financing at that time. It was one one project at a time. And I it was a it was transactional for me. You know, I was just making money financing a film. Uh, my passion for it came later on for actually producing came later on when I started reading scripts and started caring about the projects that I was involved in. And um, it, it blossomed from there. I never knew that I would meet a real life Bialystok. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so when you choose a project, what types of projects resonate with you? Yeah. So, um, I've made a few films that I'm not that proud of, but uh, <laughs> tell me it's not Hansel and Gretel got baked. Well, yeah, there you Corey go. Corey <laughs> is a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, is Corey Allen Jackson. Yeah, he's a yeah. friend of mine. He's, he's a good, good composer. Guy. Yeah, and look, the film and that was out. fun. That movie was fun. It was fun, and the and it was it was done professionally. Uh, people are always surprised when they see it, and they say, "Well, you know, the music was good. It, it really, uh, it looked like a like a professional movie." And I'm like, "Well, it was a professional movie. Um, we did it on a relatively low budget." And um, the 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 answer to your question is, films that I'm interested in in making are films that make a difference. Films that have universality of theme. Films that people can uh leave the theater uh feeling something about uh films that make people think and or films that educate people when you say that i think about that whole golden era of cinema and i don't know if it's just as i get older i recall these films that i that i've seen that inspire me and want me to go to the movies yeah. And it seems as if now we have a lot of films that are disposable. And there was even, I heard a piece about, uh, I think he worked for the New York Times. He was a critic and he got out of the business because, and it's basically of the Avengers. All these films that come out are these big blockbuster films yeah. that they're like cotton candy. They're sweet, but there's no substance. Yeah, there's a lot of that today, unfortunately. And it it's... It's all about risk aversion, right? So um, the studios who are the primary uh, feeders of theater, um, they're not willing to take large risk. So they don't want to they they don't want to produce a film like um, let's say last year's um, well, I'm blanking on it. Um, the I'm trying to think of it and it's I've lost it so they worry more about they want a guaranteed return so they're going to do Rocky 17 and Pirates of the Caribbean 12 and it's just what they're going to do because they know they'll get people in the seats um by in in masses um or something like like Barbie, which I don't want to be critical of. I haven't seen it, and uh, I've heard good things about it. Uh, but 
how much depth can it have? Um, the interesting thing is that I say that they're risk averse, the studios, but they're spending a hundred to sometimes three hundred million dollars to make a film that they know will get butts in the seat and at least break even, or they they very little rarely don't break even. Um, you know, look, uh, the last uh, Harrison Ford movie could be um, could be an example of one that doesn't pay off. Um, the Babylon movie was one that didn't pay off. But when they go with the action heroes and they go with the Mission Impossible theme, they know that it will pay off. Well, you talk about risk aversion and your new film about A.E. Stan, A.E., what is it, Stelly? Staley. A.E. Staley. He was all about risking and taking chances. Tell me about that aspect of him. He and did. also, what was it that interested you in this topic? Yeah, so it, it's funny, the way I, that I was connected with uh, the Staley family who, who made this film or assembled the film prior to my involvement. Um, I, am, I have a project called The Game of Deception, which is about a football player from the 19 teens named Chick Harley. And it, after Chick graduated from Ohio State University, he was one of the guys that was recruited by George Hallis to play for the Decatur Staleys. So a gentleman that uh, I'm associated with, he said to me, listen, I, I'm connected to the Staley family and they're interested in having their film distributed. Could you help? And I said, well, sure, let me have a look at it. And I looked at this three hour film and I said, well, that's that's not a film. That's a lot of assembled pieces. It really needs refinement. Um, so if you could make the connection and, and get me involved with the family, I'd be interested in working on finishing the film. And that's where I got involved. So um, that that's how I got connected with the Staley family. So my my interest was tangential. I, I had an interest because of the Chick Harley story. Uh, but then once I got to learn about this man, I said, this is an incredible story. This is a guy that children should be taught about in primary school. He is... Uh, every bit as uh, important to American history um, in, in the industrial forum as Carnegie, as Rockefeller, uh, as Henry Ford. Um, but he's, nobody knows this name and why. And the reason why is he didn't make as much as he could have made because he was a really good guy. He could have, his his company was sold in 1988 for $1.4 billion. It could have been 10 times that easily, but this is the kind of guy that he was. He gave people sick days and paid vacation. We're talking in the, the 1920s. Um, in 1929, when... Uh, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression came. Industrialists all over the country laid off half their staff. He reduced his employees' hours from 12-hour days to 8-hour days, but didn't cut their pay. And then he went and hired 200 more people to satisfy that work, that production shortage that he had by lowering uh, the workday, lowering the hours of the workday. So he, it was in his mind that he had to take care of the community. He had to put people that were out on the, out of work, he had to put them to work. So he got equal productivity for an extra million dollars a year in payroll in 1929. It's amazing. I yeah. mean, when I saw the trailer of the film, I'm going, all right. 
no billionaire is compassionate because it's it, 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 <laughs> well look at the film wall street michael douglas plays this guy greed is good he yep. personified the evil corporate uh billionaire and i'm thinking how is it that this person could be this this good i mean it's 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 really a rare quality because you you just don't see that today it's capitalism is the thing go after that dollar don't go after things that make you happy go after money yeah absolutely and and this is a guy that not not only did he take care of people when the depression came from the first day he opened his manufacturing plant the most important thing to him was safety now when you care about safety you lose a little bit of productivity so again he put people before profits oh interesting because uh didn't roosevelt uh there was a book called the jungle about the meat packing plants and just the horrific conditions and so yes. then that helped him implement some regulations yes so staley was kind of ahead, ahead of, of the curve yes and that's part of the film we we stress that in the film um and now a lot of this is i don't want to say boring but it's it's not a film right it's it's not something that people are going to get excited about and come to see but there's more this guy was it in an effort to care about his employees and to keep his employees fit and healthy he developed sports teams and the, these were all all different sports <coughs> pardon me um and it was in an effort to keep people healthy, fit, to keep them engaged at the workplace. People work for him for many people for 30, 40 years. And he wanted this to be a big family. Everything he did, he had to um, build a pump on the lake, of which they had to create the lake, but he built this pump um, and it was just a, a functional thing to pump water, but he decided to make it um, a, a hall at, where people could have weddings and parties and the social clubs had their headquarters there. And everything he did, he thought of, how can I make this better for the people of the community? How can he I sound, make the community he, one big family? He sounds like a real life Fezziwig. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I, I mean, he just cared and he, he would spend a lot of time at the at the plant just walking around talking to people patting them on the back thanking them for their good work and encouraging them to grow with the company people he promoted from within um people really loved this company they had huge picnics in the summer that the company paid for um, and th some of these sports teams, th this is a small farm community, and some of these sports teams were the only sports that these people knew. I mean, they'd read in the in the larger papers uh, about uh, Major League Baseball, but his baseball team was so good that they competed with the Major League Baseball teams, and it was so exciting for the community that they had to build bigger bleachers when the major league teams came into town. I mean, the world champion teams would come into town um, and it would be a three day event. So what quality, if you could, if you could give me a word for one quality that best describes A.E. Staley, what would it be? One word. Yeah. One word, one quality. Altru altruistic. So oftentimes people make projects, they write books or songs about other things, but really it's about them. They see themselves in the work. Do you see yourself in some of the qualities that he had? And if so, what? Well, uh, I mean, 
it's hard to say, but I would I would say that I'm, I'm a guy that has had ups and downs just like anyone else. And I've always um, forged ahead and found a way to succeed. Um, but also along the way, I've always taken care of the people that have been beside me. So in those two ways, I would say that I have uh, some similarity to A.E. Staley. Resilience. That's when I was reading the press notes and yeah. and determination and determination. Yeah. And where does that come from? Where did you learn to be resilient? Was it something you learned from your parents or? I, yeah, I think everyone learns that from their parents if they're lucky enough to have parents that instill these good qualities in them. Um, yeah, my mother always told me that I could do anything I set my mind to, which every mother should tell their child. Um, and uh, my father always encouraged me, even if he didn't agree with the path that I was taking in, uh, in my career. What was one of the big setbacks that you had? And uh, <clears throat> I've heard this term that failure is just feedback. Yeah. And what was something that that you attempted to do and you either failed at it or there was a setback? And what did you do to right the ship, to not give up, to hang on to that dream that you had? Yeah, so back in the early 2000s, um, I was a turnaround manager and I was turning around a company, a steel plant in Florida. And I invested in my own money. I deferred my income. And our plan was to bring the company public. As we came close to doing that in 2007, the financial crisis hit and our main financier uh, was one of the people that got wiped out um, because he wasn't, it turns out he wasn't a very good guy. Um, as a matter of fact, he's in, still in prison today. Um, of course, we had no knowledge that he wasn't a good guy. And the company ended up not being able to go public because of this. And I lost a lot of money and I never got paid all the, the deferred income. So I took a severe financial hit. And what did I do after that? I came out to LA and started a, co a production company. So, you know, with very, with meager assets, I set out to uh, find scripts that mattered and make a difference. And some of those scripts I still have today. Yeah. What was your biggest success as a producer and a film that you really felt not only resonated with you, but with audiences? Yeah. So, the films that were the most successful, I wasn't the lead producer on. I was simply a financier of, and those would be uh, The Firm and uh, Mr., uh, the talented Mr. Ripley, uh, Out of Africa, I was a production assistant on. Um, so is that Out of Africa, isn't that Cindy Pollock directed? That's correct. Yeah. It's one of my favorite directors. That was a beautiful film. It was a beautiful and film. I still watch the firm whenever it goes on. Uh, <laughs> whenever it's on TV, it's a fun movie. It's I engaging. watch the firm. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. Yes, very. It's an engaging film, um, and it it made money and it made people feel and think all all the things you want a film to do. Um, the biggest personal success that I had financially in a movie um, was. Uh, a film that I brought back-end financing to and just got paid. I was simply a, a mercenary, but I, I got a nice paycheck on, and that was Waterworld. Oh. Oh, yeah. The post-apocalyptic post romp, huh? Yeah, yeah. Kevin, uh, was it um, Kevin Costner? Yes. I mean, it has some redeeming moments, that film. It it did. I, you know, I liked it. I know a lot of people didn't like it. You know, Kevin made that movie with his money. Um, he he was all in on that film. And the the people that came in at the end, they got their money back first. 
he had to wait for his money. It took him 25 years to recoup. 25 years. Is it yeah. that um, the people that uh, are involved in the film, do they delay? Do they come up with, oh, we haven't made a profit yet or what have you? You're talking in general or? Specific? Yeah, in general, because why does it take so long? Why did it take him so long to get his money back? Oh, it took him so long to get his money back because the film didn't uh, waterfall money um, all at once. Uh, it, he spent, I don't know, about $150 million of his own money to make the film. Um, the people that came in afterwards spent about $50 million, and that $50 million gets paid back first. It was the last money in, first out. So the film at the box office didn't generate $400 million that it would have needed to to pay him back so he had to scrape and get uh residuals from tv deals and um second look deals and it, it was a long time it seems like you have to have a thick skin to work in the film industry because of the egos and the cutthroat nature of that business yes it it is not a business uh, to be entered into lightly, um, whether it's your own money or other people's money as a producer, you're responsible for that money. So you need to make sure that you know what you're doing and you have a distribution route um, that is capable of paying these people back. There's always risk, but you want to mitigate risk. You have a, um, a screening of the film coming up, right? That is correct. That's it's called a, Field, of, Field of Gold, right? Fields of Gold. It's Fields the, of Gold. Yes, at the Fine Arts Theater. And there are still tickets available and they're complimentary. And um, I've heard that you've invited uh, some people, uh, athletes that are going to come out. Who are some of the people that have agreed to come out? Because these are all, aren't these people that are in the Hall of Fame? Uh, um, they There are people in the Hall of Fame. Right now we've got, I believe, Eric Dickerson. LA guy, the Rams go. Yep. Love the Rams. Um, we had another one who is not able to make it, and that was, um, well, I can't think of his name. He was with, what's his name? Marcus Allen, but he can't. Yeah, make Marcus it. Allen, USC guy. Yep. But the um, the president of the, the former president of the Pro Football Hall of Fame is going to be there. Um, oh, boy, you're testing me with names, though. That's okay. We, yeah. We, so there's and there'll there'll be some celebrities there, uh, some uh, I don't want to call them movie stars, but recognizable people from films. Mm -hmm. um, so and there'll be lots of producers and um, and other directors other than our director. So it it'll be a fun time, and we're doing a whole red carpet. The red carpet starts at five o'clock. Doors will open at six o'clock. Um, we'll have some, uh, uh, Julie and I will say a few words at 6.45 and at seven o'clock we'll have the screening. Um, and the, the movie is two hours and eight minutes. So by 9.15, the doors will open for people to exit. So is the film going to platform? Do you, have a, do you have a distribution on it? Right now we've got a limited theatrical run in Decatur, Illinois. Um, and that's going to be after our Decatur premiere, which is September 16th. So it'll run for six weeks at the Lincoln Square Theater in Decatur, Illinois. And between the time that it premieres there and the time that the, the run ends, I will be negotiating deals for streaming and television. Seems like that's where uh, the big thing is. But... I've, I've heard, uh, maybe you can amplify this, that for the streaming, for a film to really do well, it has to screen in a real theater. And then that has more cachet when you sell it to a, a company like Gravitas or or another streaming platform. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. So we won't have that here. It's also a documentary. So it's tough getting a documentary sold. This was a labor of love. Um, this is... This film was not made to make a profit. It is made to tell this man's story. And I believe that um, over the next five years, we'll be 
able to get it uh, the market sufficiently saturated with this film um, that it'll play on, let's say, History Channel or P and PBS and, and places like that. So hopefully more and more people will learn about this great man. And if just the handful of kids learn about him and they become successful and they run their companies like he ran his, the world will be a better place. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds awesome. I mean, I really respect the fact that you're doing something based on, based on a passion and not a paycheck. Yeah. There's I mean, no, paycheck there's is good. Paycheck. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, uh, those are those legacy things. It's, it's like his legacy, what yes. he did. I mean, we didn't talk about it, but he started out in the soybean business and he yes. built that up and that became, I mean, soybean is like one of the biggest crops out there. What did, what legacy do you think he had based on agriculture? And then in, in terms of uh, sports, because the Chicago sure. bears, that's part of his legacy too, right? Yeah, so two amazing th things that he is credited with. Um, one, there would be no soybeans in America if it wasn't for A.E. Staley. Um, when he was a, a young lad, his father intro introduced, well, he his father introduced him to some missionaries who had traveled in China. And these missionaries had given his father these seeds. And his father gave them to to young a e staley and he planted a couple of rows of beans in the garden and he cultivated those himself and he, he loved them and then he dreamed someday of using soybeans and when he became a big success in manufacturing it was corn it was cornstarch um but he went around he he had a train that he called the soybean special that he worked with the illinois central railroad and he went from town to town throughout the midwest telling farmers if you grow soybeans i'll buy them and he did he kept his word and he was the first manufacturer of soy products and these products were used to feed cattle and they were they they didn't end up on the on the plate of Americans for decades, uh, but they were used to feed cattle. But the most important thing was the soybeans provided nitrogen to the soil, which helped the corn grow better the following season. So now today they have uh, nitrogen that you can buy to to help the soil. But many farmers in the Midwest still rotate their crops corn to soybeans um and it, this is a natural way of uh replenishing the soil with the nutrients needed for the other crop what qualities i mean here is somebody that that rose i mean they call it a rag to rags to riches story what is it that makes a person go from rags to riches because he's there with other people and yet he's the one yeah. that blazed a trail or even yourself i mean so many people want to get in the film industry but they they never make it yeah they just become part of the statistics that just have never done anything what do right. you think it is what makes a person rise to greatness it's it's sheer determination with staley he was 18 when his father died and he was the man of the family and he could have just stayed there and worked the farm and they would have survived and and done well it was a big farm but he left his little brother in charge and he went out selling for 13 years and he made enough money not only to support himself but he kept sending money back to support that farm and support his mom and his brother and his sisters and he never forgot about that farm. He always he always cared about that farm, even when he was very successful. Um, he bought the best equipment for his brother to work on a, on that farm. So, so well, recently uh, there's been a lot of talk about AI, 
Yes. And um, you use AI in your film to correct photos that, and I read that some of the photos are 150 years old. Yes, yeah, some of the photos wow. are up to 150 years old. That's correct. So there's one side of the aisle saying AI is going to just destroy the creative industry. It's going to take jobs away, really from every industry. Yeah. And then, but it also has the benefit. I mean, I, you were able to correct these images. What are your feelings about AI and should we limit it? Should there be some restraints and regulations about using it? Because I think it's also why the why the uh, the guild is on strike, right? Because yes. of it's That's the actors correct. that are on strike. Yeah. So the way we used AI was was unique, and we only used it to enhance photographs, and it didn't work well with photographs with multiple people in it. So it had its limitations, but it was very effective um, where, the, where there weren't multiple faces in detail. Uh, but it, this is very different from what um, SAG-AFTRA has a problem with. They have a problem with AI being used when an image is not um, 150 years old, but rather your image and my image right now, capturing that and then using it to make a film, um, to make a commercial. And they're right, that shouldn't be done, that's wrong. So there has to be limitations, there has to be restraints. And of, of course, we're in full support of the union in, in their cause against, against the use of AI. Yeah. What would you like an audience to go away with after they see your film, Fields of Gold? I want people to feel like there's hope that that there are good people out there. Um, you know, it's e it's easy to look at every wealthy person and say they're no good. They they have they don't have the interest of the little guy uh, at heart. But I think there are wealthy people that care. Um, and, and I think they, they do good things like Bill Gates and they do good things with their money and they care about society. Um, so I, I hope that people go away with, with that warm feeling. When, um, if we were to flash forward and, uh, people look back on your body of work, what would you want them to say about you? I want them to say that I that I cared, that I wanted to make a difference. And I think that the best is yet to come um, for me. Uh, we've got some unbelievable films ahead. Uh, Delfino's Journey is, uh, we're, we're striving to make that our next movie. And uh, that's an immigration story. And it's based on a true story. So I, I think that the best is yet to come. And, and I hope that people look back and say that I, I cared about the product. I cared about the story. Um, and I, I strove to make a difference. When you say the best is yet to come, I think about Tony Bennett, who would recently yeah. passed away. Yeah. And remember seeing him a couple of times. Just He just really loved what he did. And it sounds like you love what you do i do indeed well yeah, keep, you, that, keep that passion thank you i i will and with tony bennett you could see it even when uh one one of his last big performances with the lady gaga uh the moments the the look on his face and her face it, it was amazing i saw him at the house of blues and yeah. um he goes you know he had kind of that voice and so he, he said turn off the microphones and he's saying, I left my heart in San Francisco without any amplification. Yeah. And then a couple of nights later, I saw him. There was a new place called Billboard Live that had opened. And I saw him there. And it was just, he was just amazing. And I think what was so appealing is that he just loved doing what he did. Yes. And did you ever see the film, The Oscar, with... Uh, 
Stephen Boyd, Tony Bennett is in. He plays a small character. I don't think I did see that. No. Steve, Stephen Boyd is uh, he's being nominated for an Oscar, but it's kind of this thing where his career is stalling, and uh, he's up for a dog food commercial. And then he goes to this restaurant and he sees somebody that he knows, an actor, and he's he goes, "Oh, you having lunch?" He goes, "No, I work here." <laughs> so he, he just gets gets so freaked out. Yeah. But then when he's nominated, cool. it's a, that's a great movie. Well, anyway, best of luck with Fields of Gold. Thank and you. And you, you also, we have just a few minutes left, but you also have people in the film uh, that are interviewed. Do you have a a couple of favorites that are in the film and? something that they said resonated with you yeah um there's a a new newscaster named sean streety and um he well, got a great voice and he made a statement and it, it was in the trailer as well that um a.e staley touched so many families in this community it's unbelievable um, and and that's the essence of the story. So nice. uh, you know, there there were we had people from the Pro Football Hall of Fame, from uh, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, um George McCaskey, the chairman of the Chicago Bears, um is in the film six times or so. Um, so and we didn't talk about that, that 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 that's a big part of this story that um staley allowed the team to move to chicago and eventually become the chicago bears they were the, the chicago staley's for one year uh but that again that was his giving he 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 paid for the moving expenses of the team five thousand dollars and then let them let them go essentially gave up his ownership uh but without him there wouldn't have been the chicago bears were you a bears fan i'm not a big bears fan but I, I am a football fan and but without the bears and hallis there also would have been no nfl so um the really? nfl that that was negotiated by hallis um with jim thorpe and and the other owners of industrial teams um before the formation of the nfl you think when he was uh setting up this pretty much recreation baseball and football for his employees do you think he had a vision that eventually it would become professional i mean back in the 20s i don't think so i i he was staley was president of the industrial league and that that was professional it just wasn't the nfl i mean these players got paid um so he loved the sport. Uh, he loved baseball. He loved football. And he wanted people to enjoy the game. He wasn't one of these guys that thought about making millions of dollars from sports. Uh, sports didn't pay off big back then. Um, it was just that he was a sports enthusiast. And um, he wanted his people to enjoy it. And he wanted them to be healthy. And he wanted the community to be entertained. And he got all of those things through the sports teams. Has your kind of philosophy or your value set changed as you've gotten older? I mean, have you always had this, this sense of, I'm going to do things that have, you know, substantial as opposed to just money? Because it seems like the trajectory of, people they start out they just want the fancy car they want to make all that money but as they get older they become more altruistic or have you always been that way well the the we have about a minute we're almost out of yeah time. so it was always important to make money especially when i was raising a family but i always wanted to do things that matter it was yeah. always important to me to make a difference well, thank you so much, Michael Pollack. Best of luck with Fields of Gold and uh, the other films that are coming out. And keep us posted. Will do. I'll look forward to speaking with you again. All righty. You be All well, right. my friend. And have a thank good you. opening. Thank As you they very say much. in theater, Mared. Thank you. <laughs> Until next time.
This is Mark Gordon, and I'll see you center stage. Center stage.